Welcome back to the third lecture of the third week of bioenergetics of life processes. So, in the last class, we talked about the structure of the chloroplast and I told you that where possibly chloroplast may have parasitized the transition from anaerobic to the aerobic world and possibly somewhere out there. Those organelle which were getting extinct somewhere or other encapsulated themselves in an surrounding and somewhere or other. We really do not know how that possibly have happened, but that is what at least with the intellectual ability of mankind, we as a race contemplate. So, coming back to the structure of the chloroplast. So, this is what we, what we talked about. The chloroplast has three different kind of membranes. The inner membrane, so if you look at it, the inner membrane, the outer membrane, and the thylakoid membrane. And we talked about three different kind of spaces, the space between the inner and the outer membrane, between this green and the yellow. Then you have a space, the stroma, which is the space. And then you have the thylakoid space, which is between the thylakoid membrane. So, today let us let us resume our week 3 lecture 3 and in sum total this is lecture 13. So, if you look at the chloroplast, so, chloroplast as such, the thylakoid membrane contains the, the energy transducing machinery. So, it is out here the thylakoid membrane which has the TM or thylakoid membrane. This contains the energy transducing machinery, energy transducing machinery and which is essentially these are the point which light harvesting proteins light harvesting proteins then you have the reaction centers Rx is the reaction, reaction centers. Then you have electron transport chain, electron transport chains, and you have ATP synthase. So, now, if I have to put it together, so this is where light harvesting we talked about, this is where how this is translated into the reaction center and this is where the whole flow of electron is happening and then the synthesis ATP synthase. So, which is and this is governed by again the chemi osmotic hypothesis. So, if you look back where we started the show for this week, we talked about the photosynthesis, we talked about the chloroplast and the generation of energy rich molecule out here, which is now let us fit in. ATP synthase governed by chemiosmotic hypothesis. And 
another system which is mitochondria which is non light dependent and it does it in a different way and we will talk about it. So, this is when in the global scheme of things, things falls. So, that is why I did not introduce this slowly I wanted to come and now ATP synthase when you talk about in the chloroplast it is in the thylakoid membrane where it is located. So, it is in the thylakoid membrane where ATP synthase is present. Okay. So, and if you really look at the chloroplast, they have nearly equal amount of lipids and protein and the lipid composition is highly distinctive. About 40 percent of the total lipids are galactolipids. and 4 percent are sulfolipids and what are the significance we really do not know so very well and 10 percent are phospholipids and which has ne nearly equal amount of almost equal amount of lipids and proteins. That is what makes up the thylakoid membrane. And the thylakoid membrane, like the inner mitochondrial membrane, is impermeable to most of the molecules. So, if you look at this thylakoid membrane, this is very similar to the cell membrane, which is semi permeable. So, if you go back to the first week lectures when we talked about like let me see if I could really take you back there when I talked about making of the membrane template for complex synthesis and self assembly of making these kind of membranes which are formed. So, possibly these membranes now this is where it was these kind of membranes have learned to be semi permeable or selectively permeable. So, how they learn this is another very interesting story, okay. but this fundamental concept if you recollect when I told you that all these membranes are semi permeable in nature and they are asymmetric in nature and now I am adding one more thing they are made up of lipids and proteins and with some form of carbs carbohydrates. So, now talking about thylakoid membrane. Now, let us come back and again start where we were. So, it consists of equal amount of lipids and proteins and the lipids are either galactolipids, sulfolipids and phospholipids at different composition where you have 40 percent of the lipids are galactolipids, sulfolipids are around 4 percent and 10 percent are phospholipids. Okay. The thylakoid membrane, the inner mitochondrial membrane is impermeable to most of the molecules and ion. The outer membrane of the chloroplast like that of mitochondria is highly permeable to small molecules which is we are talking about this outer membrane is permeable to small molecules and ions. The stroma contains soluble enzymes. This is the stroma, this is a region which contain all sorts of soluble and when we talk about soluble we are talking about water soluble, soluble enzymes okay, that utilized NADPH and that utilize the NADPH and ATP synthesized by the thylakoid membrane. So, th what these enzymes are doing is that these solubilized enzymes. So, the stroma contains soluble enzymes that utilize the NADPH and ATP at the stroma, the soluble enzymes are utilizing this NADPH and the ATP in order to convert the CO2 into sugar. This is where 
the conversion of CO2 to sugar is happening which is the reduction reaction. And the chloroplast contain its own DNA and its own machinery for replicating and expressing it. However, chloroplast like mitochondria are autonomous, are not autonomous. They also contain many protein encoded by the nuclear DNA. So, somewhere or other, at some point or other, after getting parasitized, these organelle chloroplast or mitochondria. So, this is again the other organelle what we will be dealing with out here what we have mentioned once again mitochondria. These two are believed to have parasitized the bigger or some other cell. So, now though they have their own DNA or own genetic material, both mitochondria and the chloroplast. So, once again, this is what it means, empty, empty DNA which is the mitochondrial DNA and CHL DNA is the chloroplast DNA, though they have their own DNA, but interestingly and they code, they code us and, and it is that their DNA which is responsible for the replications and everything. All their division is carried out by their own DNA. Yet, they are not um, competent enough to have a autonomous existence. They cannot survive independently. That is the cost they have paid by parasitizing themselves into another host. So, they lost their ability to have an independent existence unlike possibly they used to have at some point in distant past. Okay. So, now having said this about the chloroplast. Now, let us move on to the basic reactions of discovery of the basic reactions of photosynthesis. Okay. Discovery of the basic reactions of photosynthesis. So, if you look at most of the basic equations of photosynthesis could have been written at the end of 18th century. The production of oxygen in photosynthesis was discovered in 1780 by Joseph Priestley. So, Joseph Priestley basically he found that the plants could restore air which has not been injured by the burning of candles. Basically, a simple experiment they did that whatever is coming out from the plant, they basically could help the life to survive. Okay. So, Priestley has this classic experiment where you have say for example, you have a plant in a chamber where you have a green plant growing and this is connected to You have this bell jar where you have an animal surviving. Okay. So, essentially the plant is giving away oxygen and this oxygen is helping this animal to survive. Now, if you burn this, so basically he found that the plants could restore air which has been injured by the burning of candle. He placed a sprig of mint in an invert inverted glass jar in a vessel of water and found several days later that the air would neither extinguish a candle nor was it all inconvenient to a mouse which was put there. Okay. So, similarly you can you know burn a candle out there and it would not get ex extinguished. So, this was the first discovery in the photosynthesis that oxygen is evolved in photosynthesis. Now, going by 
going back to that deceptively simple reaction where it all started. In the light of this, if you look at this reaction, everything will make sense, that oxygen evolution. Okay? So, this was the first of the very foremost discovery of photosynthesis, the evolution of oxygen. Okay. The next major contribution to the elucidation of photosynthesis was made by Jian Haus, who was a Dutchman. So, basically, based on Priestley's experiment, he went further and uh, what he did is that he figured out. So, according to his own language, he discovered that the role of light in photosynthesis. So, basically, it is the person who discovered that photosynthesis can only happen in the presence of light. So, this was Jan Ingenhaus's discovery that it is not only that it is producing oxygen, for this process to happen, you need light. So, this was the second distinct contribution. Okay? And followed by that, there was another guy called Jean Senebeer. His distinctive contribution was to show that the fixed air, namely CO2, is taken up in photosynthesis. So, basically, the third name which comes into play is Jean Senebeer, who showed that. CO2 is used in the process of uh, carbon dioxide fixation or in photosynthesis. So, now we have dealt with three different things. So, this gentleman showed the role of light, Priestley showed the evolution of oxygen, Geo Senebier stated that it is the carbon dioxide which is involved in it. Okay. These are the three major contribution which was made in the very early between 1700 and 1800 centuries. So, we will close in here. In the next class, we will move on to the role of the chlorophyll molecules. Okay? Thank you.